So we finished whatever 7.5 was, all the L'Hopital's indeterminate forms, and we're into 7.6 now. So it's inverse trig functions. This is one of the longer sections, I think in my notes, it's like six pages, six pages, so it's pretty serious. You're gonna find that most of what we conclude at the end is things we've already computed. Like one of the first major things we do is find the anti, find the derivative of sine inverse is the first major calculus thing that we do. But we're going over a lot of inverse trig identities that are not quite the same as the regular trig identities. So there'll be a lot of sort of algebra and trig mixed in that you won't necessarily need uh, most of that. You'll just need the inverse trig uh, derivatives, which give you these funky, uh, we saw a tangent, derivative tangent inverse was one over one plus x squared. So we're gonna use those really for the antiderivative. So like the antiderivative one over one plus x squared will be tangent inverse. So mm -hmm. that's mainly what we're gonna be getting out of this section. All right, we'll start with uh, inverse functions in general. So we'll do the sine function. We graph that out really, really quickly. Looks something like this. What is the only property we need for a function to have an inverse? There was one property we needed. One to one. All right, so one to one. This function is definitely not one to one, so we chop it up. And how do we do that? We're going to throw away all of the parts that would sort of loop back on themselves, repeated y values. So what does it make sense to keep close to zero and then as much as you can go either direction? So we go pi over 2 gets us x value pi over 2 is there and negative pi over 2. So we're going to have a restricted domain. So the way we write that, there's a few ways to write it. You could do a vertical bar, and then the restricted domain is negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. We're including endpoints of x. So this is really the function we're going to be using. And we're just throwing out all the uh, parts of the domain that would not allow us to have one-to-one. -one. So there's sine. Now this sine has an inverse. You can write it down. F inverse, we're just going to write as sine inverse x. Of course, if you're on web work or depending on what source you, you're looking at, you can see it as arc sine. So web work, if you go sine ash, uh, caret negative 1, it won't like that, so use arc sign on web work. And depending on what resource you look at online or other textbooks, you can see arc sign written different places. So just be aware sine inverse is arc sign. They're the same thing. And if we write out y equals sine inverse x, if we turn this around, we can write it as actually I usually eraser there we go I'm gonna move the function over as its inverse and of course it's the inverse inverse so this is sine of y equals X now I really restricted the domain uh oh I don't know why that was deleted so I moved the function over, but there is a restriction on y. Uh, y cannot be anything. Y has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So if we are looking at the right side, we need to make sure y is in the interval negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. All right, so that is how to flip around an inverse function. Now I'm just going to basically scroll and try to get all of 7.6 on one really long page. And just we just keep scrolling and scrolling and I will do my plan is to post the videos up on YouTube and I believe there's some way to post up these Microsoft OneNote files up there somehow so you theoretically sh at some point you will be able to sort of look through this even I don't know how it will do it if you don't have OneNote or don't use Windows but probably some way to view it as HTML or something so 
this had a flip around the sine inverse function. Uh, we can do the same thing for cosine. So really quickly do a cosine. We're going to be, of course, restricting it. And we'll see what we restrict it to. So when we use cosine, really fast graph of cosine is going to look like this, et cetera, et cetera. We only want a small part of it. And we're going to use zero. And it makes sense if you're going to use zero. If you go left, you can't go right. If you go right, you can't go left to be one to one. So let's take the positive interval. So we'll go zero to, this is going to be pi right here. So we're throwing away everything over there. So we're going to zero to pi. And I'm not really talking about the range of the original cosine function. The range is always negative one to one. Uh, when I do the inverse function, the, I think I talked about this way back in 7.1. You have f, f inverse. Usually we call this the range of f, domain of f. And we go this way, left to right. We have uh, f. If we go back the other way, it's f inverse. So if you ask the function f, what is this set over here? Did I just lose something else on the screen? Yeah, part of the codes. Oh, jeez. Anybody seen the movie Memento? <laughs> I feel like that. I feel like I should take a lesson in movies and watch it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have good recommendations. All right. So f inverse. If you ask f inverse, hey, what's that you just said over there on the left? It's going to say, oh, that's the range of f inverse. That's the range of f inverse. And over here will be the domain of f inverse. So depending on what perspective you have, you could think of those two sets uh, with sort of different names. So when we restrict the domain of cosine, that will be the range of cosine inverse. So we're going to go 0 to pi. This is going to be our restricted domain of our cosine function. Right there, x coordinate 0 to x coordinate pi. And I'm not going to write the range out, negative 1 to positive 1. OK. So we can do the same, uh, flipping this around with the inverse notation, cos inverse x. Oh, I did the other. Oh, it doesn't matter. Cos inverse x equals y is the same as x equals cos y, but when you write x equals cos y, you have to be mindful that we're restricting input between 0 and pi. So you have to make sure that x is between 0 and pi. So just to warn you, sometimes things are going to get messed up and the recording may not get posted. So I recommend, um, I already had one problem where it just quits the recording application right in the middle of recording. So there's no guarantee that I can post everyone online. So I'll do my best, but because of technical stuffs, um, I recommend you still take notes. And of course, still come to class. Uh, uh, <laughs> we all saw that one. James, you're the expert. Have you ever had that happen? OK. All right. I should buy one so you can do it online, and then I'd have all the recordings anyways. It's a reasonable idea. All right, so let's pretend like that's still there. All right. So we can do, I'll just do one example. We've done a whole lot of this way back in trig, uh, trig class years ago. All right, how do I do sine inverse square root 3 over 2? So this is our first example problem. So what I like to do normally, uh, our trig functions eat angles and give us sides. So our arc trig or inverse trig are going to eat sides and give us angles. So I just see, just from the form of this number right here, this does not look like an angle. looks like some sides right here. So this is going to be an angle. So I want to find this. So I'm going to let theta equal 
sine inverse negative square root 3 over 2. Flip the sine function around. So it's sine theta equals negative square root 3 over 2. There should only be one answer for this. And theta, sine of what is negative square root 3 over 2? I'm going to be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So this should be pi over 3. Negative pi over 3. Negative pi over 3. Are you worried if you make a mistake, you'll be on YouTube forever saying the wrong answer? <laughs> All right, you'll be the first person saying something false on YouTube, so you should be very worried. All right, negative pi over 3. All right. I could do, oh, there's, do this one for cosine now. All right, before we even worry about figuring this out, is cosine allowed to eat 5 pi over 3? Just regular cosine function. Forget about what I wrote up here. Regular cosine function can eat 5 pi over 3. So how can we deal with this? Uh, there's a few ways to do this. Uh, because this is a nice angle we know about, we could actually go and get the cosine value and then figure out uh, what it should be from there. There is a, another way we can do this. Cosine inverse outputs an angle. So I can let theta equal all this stuff. Cos inverse of cos 5 pi over 3. Bring the outer cos inverse function to the other side. And now the question is cosine of what? And when I brought this over, I have to make sure that cosine, this angle is between 0 and pi. So I need theta be, to be between 0 and pi. That is the rule that we have up here with the cos inverse bring, turning it into a regular cosine. You sort of have to keep that in mind. You could pick up, if, you, if this was, I can't cover stuff up. Oh, I can do this. If this was the entire problem right here, find theta or solve for theta, and I didn't give you, uh, this is the starting problem, there would be an infinite number of answers. But that's not where we started. We started right up here. So we started with cos inverse of some stuff. So there should be one answer. So we have to go and figure out which one of those infinite answers should we have. We need to be in quadrant one or two. So let's go ahead and figure out where's five pi over three, if we count in thirds. This is pi, which is 3 pi over 3. And again, when you're in trig class, uh, fractions suck unless you have common denominators. So if you go into thirds, it's a lot easier to think in fractions because it, everything is a third. You're basically dealing in slices of pizza, and everybody likes pizza. So this is 6 pi over 3, uh, also known as 2 pi. So when you see this, you're, you can see how far around you need to go. We're going five thirds of the way around, um, six thirds. So we're going to be right there. Oh, we can use fancy colors now. So if I cut it all up into thirds right here, there's one, two, three, four. That'll be the fifth third. Or maybe I'm not saying that right. Fifth, sixth. I don't know. I think you understand what I mean. So anyways, that's 5 pi over 3. Cosine is the x value right there. And from trig class, that should be 1 half. So 1 half is that x value. So cos of 1 half. Cos 5 pi over 3 equals a half. That is not actually necessary to solve this. Uh, what you need to know is what angle, oh, look at this technology. It's amazing. All right. What angle do we have right here? This angle is theta. That has the same x value as the 5 pi over 3 angle, the long way around. And that is 5 over 3. All right. 
So there we go, pi over 3. So this is one of the trickier, more technical problems that people usually gloss over from trigonometry class is the way these sort of cancel out, but not exactly. So it's a little misleading. Cos inverse is not the full inverse of cosine. It's the inverse of cosine if you chop up the domain really small. So depending on what situation you're in, we restricted the domain to get cos inverse. But the regular cosine function written out normally does not have a restricted domain. So cos inverse is not the full inverse of cosine. It's the inverse of cosine on some really tiny domain. All right, so now I'm going to go with some identities here. So I'm going to draw a big unit circle, but only the upper half. Oh, now all my sp spelling errors will exist forever. It's wonderful. But I can draw perfect circles. That's a tr good trade-off. Oh, a perfect oval. Good enough. So, where are we going first? We'll have some x value right there. And I want that point in the unit circle. So I'm going to call that angle theta. How do we relate theta and x? So, and we're on the unit circle. That's one, that's one, all that fun stuff. So, cos theta is x. Cos theta, oh no. It's going to be really annoying. Cos theta equals x. And I'm going to uh, bring the cosine function to the other side. Theta equals cos inverse x. So just flipping it around. And we'll pretend like, uh, or not pretend, but our, we'll assume our angles are nice so we don't have to worry about um, you know, where they live. I'm going to draw most things in the first quadrant. So we'll be good to go. Uh, so this angle right here, I'm going to write as cos inverse x. Cos inverse x. So that is the angle right there. Now we're going to get the angle up here. It's a little bit weird because we don't usually measure angles starting way up there. So it's a different angle measurement than we're used to. So how in the world can I get that angle? And what you need to think about here, what do you need to think about? Oh, I just lost, jeez. So I'm measuring the wrong way, or I should say I'm measuring to the wrong axis. So what you need to do is change the way you're thinking about this. So I cannot rotate anything. Wait, I can rotate things. Can I?
There we go. We want to go right, left. Didn't flip vertical. Oh, I'm not. All right. Can you tap the corner with your tap the corner with your mirror? I think it's only highlighting the circle, which has too much symmetry. I can rotate it any degree, and it's going to look exact. Well, it's an oval. If you saw it, move the tiniest little bit because it's off by like a pixel or two. It's technically an oval. All right. So we're going to have to use our imaginations. So that angle measurement, think about that being the x-axis going straight up right there. And this would be the x measurement will actually be a measurement on the y-axis. I guess I'll have to redraw it. OK, so we'll pick this up tomorrow. It's going to end up being sine inverse x is that angle.